Good morning. Good morning. How y'all doing? Y'all right. <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> if you're new here among us, my name is Gene and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. So as you can see, if you've been coming here week after week, some things are slowly changing. We share the, pa- the space with Naples Performing Arts Center and we're trying to come up with some set designs that work for both of us. So bear with us as we experience some technical issues. We will be getting a new computer. Some of you know, you've known me for a while, and you know I used to be on the worship team, and having glitches like that is your worst nightmare, because it's awkward. (laughs) I told them, next time it happens, just freeze, and then like come back again. It would be really cool, like they did it on purpose. So I appreciate our worship team. We're blessed with some really wonderful singers. Um, So I really appreciate that. The worship is great. So today, I'm excited to be in the second part of our Corinthians series. This is where we are looking at the biblical books, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Those crazy Corinthians. These are letters written to the church in Corinth addressing a lot of different issues. So we're going to ask the question, are we any different. A lot of self-reflection here in this series. So Dane set it up nicely last week with some interview questions. I hope my answers were okay. (laughs) We introed it and overviewed it just a little bit. If you read the introduction to the study guide that accompanies this series, you'll note that I said one of the most difficult things for a pastor or a preacher on a Sunday morning is the one-room schoolhouse effect. It is K through 12 in one room. So I could have someone come in who doesn't know anything about Christianity, nothing about the faith at all. And then I could have a theologian in the room at the same time. So how do you remedy this? Well, the public school system remedied it by coming up with grade levels, right? No more one-room schoolhouse. We're going to do grades. So you might learn about something in history at a basic level in elementary school. And then you get to middle school, and you'll learn a little more about it. You get to high school, you learn a little more about it. You get to college, and they tell you everything you learned was wrong. (laughs) All right? We're not going to do that to you just yet. But this is a basic, maybe intermediate level In the app, I put some more notes in there for you guys, and I encourage you all to come to Bible study, 6 p.m. Wednesdays. I teach it myself. I'm there for you. We also have a school of theology here if you really want to dig deeper. So we're always encouraging you to go further. That's what the study guide is all about. So just a quick recap. I already said what these are, these books of the Bible. They're letters written by Paul the Apostle to the church in Corinth around 55 to 57 A.D. Now, this is relatively close to the crucifixion of Christ, maybe 25 or so years after. And we discussed in weeks past that this is very good historically. In ancient history, often things are written way after the events. I compared it to Alexander the Great for apologetics' sake. The writings that we have for him come three to 400 years after Alexander's death. Now, to clarify, that doesn't mean that nothing at all was written about him. It just means that that's all we have. So we don't know exactly what those earlier writings say. These are the earliest witnesses to Alexander. Three and four hundred to get our best ones in Plutarch, Life of Alexander, years later. So Jesus is, uh, I'm sorry, sorry, the, the, the Gospels, the letters are very close to Jesus. Very close. 25 years is close. They are witnesses to Jesus. These are people who knew him. They're writing about him. And we'll see in 15, 1 Corinthians 15, that they're challenging him. Go check with the other witnesses. Ask Peter. Ask all these guys about what we saw. So this is really, really good stuff from a historical perspective. So I want to set up a visual. I think that would be helpful this morning. A visual of Corinth. So if we can get a picture of it, this is kind of a, a recreation of, of Corinth here. So we can't get an actual picture of Corinth because they didn't have iPhones back then, just Blackberries, and they, those don't come with a camera. So <clears throat> maybe this is what it looked like, but we have ancient ruins in Corinth. I guess they can recreate it like that. Not much left. If we continue on, you'll see the Temple of Apollos, and that's Acro-Corinth in the background. We have another picture of Acro-Corinth. 
Right? So it just means upper and Acropolis in Greek is just an upper place. It's a high point where they'd have fortifications, Acro Corinth, Upper Corinth. We have an aerial view, I think, we threw in there of it. And as you can see, it's a port city like I described last week. And I wanted to give you guys a visual of modern Corinth as well. So you see they have a bridge like we have here in Florida. It's kind of like Florida, except not completely flat. Yeah. All right. So let's jump right into the letter. We're going to get right into the greeting. Greetings are really important. I think I've encouraged you in the past about that, but at Bible study I talked about that. Greetings are super important, and so are the endings. You find a lot of cool stuff in there if you dig. So we're going to focus on that right now. Paul, called as an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will and Sosthenes, our brother, to God's church at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus and called as saints, with all those in every place who call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both their Lord and ours. So Paul, he opens this letter by calling himself an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, although Paul will spend some time in his letters defending his apostleship, and we'll talk about why later, we mustn't think of this as Paul just throwing a title around. It's not like that. Apostle simply means sent one or messenger. It comes from the word apostolos, which means just to send forth. It's kind of like missionary today, the way we would think of a missionary. The word is used when Jesus sends his disciples out to preach in Mark 3, in Matthew chapter 10. He calls them apostles. Here, Paul is describing himself as someone who is chosen by God and sent out as a messenger of Jesus Christ. In his opening to the Galatians, he makes this very clear. Paul, an apostle, not from men or by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Now, as noted in the book, there's a difference between the 12 apostles and Matthias and Paul, by extension, and an apostle, like a missionary or messenger, Epaphroditus in Philippians. It calls him a messenger in most translations. If you look under it in the Greek, it actually says apostle. But they translate it as messenger so we don't get confused. So there's like a capital A apostle, maybe a lowercase a apostle if you want to think about it this way. This is a common greeting that Paul uses and is sometimes accompanied by the self-description of slave. Doulon in Greek is in Romans, Philippians, and Titus, 1, 1, and 1. Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle. Now, it's important to note Paul's humility here. Many make themselves important through titles. He's not saying something like, I'm the Apostle Paul, like we might today. Paul just says he's a slave of Christ Jesus. If I want to introduce myself from a biblical perspective, it might be something like Gene, a slave of God, appointed as a pastor of Jesus Christ Church here in Naples. It's kind of long, right? But how did I introduce myself? I'm Gene, and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. It's about servant leadership, trying to exemplify what we see in Jesus. We talked about the washing of the feet last week. If I, your Lord and your teacher, do this for you, what then should you do for each other? That's the idea here. We talked about the gifts versus the offices. Remember that? <clears throat> we saw a whole bunch of gifts dispensed by the Holy Spirit who does not discriminate. Galatians 3, 28, there's no longer slave or free, Jew or Gentile, male or female. And a lot of people were surprised at what was on that list in the gifting section. They included things like teaching or shepherding, pastoring. Then they had the offices, overseer, elder, and deacon. Now, arguably, the first two, we don't see females in that role, but we see a deaconess in Phoebe. So it was quite interesting there. So <clears throat> from a Bible-centric description, I play the role of an elder here. That is my office in the church. You guys call me pastor, that's fine. You're calling me by one of my giftings. Indeed, I shepherd here at the church. And everyone knows what pastor means here in America. Plus, 
I don't use elder because I'm not going to grow a long white beard out. Even if I wanted to do that, Heather will not let me. So we forego that terminology. So here we have divisions in the church according to the leadership. People are chasing after these different leaders. So watch what we see here. He writes, now I urge you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree in what you say, that there be no divisions among you, and that you be united with the same understanding and the same conviction. For it has been reported to me about you, my brothers, by members of Chloe's household, not Chloe on the worship team, a different one, that there is rivalry among you. What I'm saying is this, each one of you says, I'm with Paul, or I'm with Apollos, or I'm with Peter, or I'm with Christ. Is Christ divided? Was it Paul who was crucified for you? Or were you baptized in Paul's name? I thank God that I baptized none of you, except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did, in fact, baptize the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to evangelize. Not with clever words, so that the cross of Christ will not be emptied of its effect. So here, we have people creating divisions, factions. Do people still do this today? Are we any different? How often do people join a church because they like the pastor? And then they leave because the pastor they liked leaves. Are they following the pastor or Jesus? It would be like people saying, I like the way Gene preaches better than Dane, or I like the way Dane preaches better than Gene. I like the way Heather preaches, and then not showing up if they know that person is preaching, or showing up if they know that person is preaching, or leaving the church because so-and-so leaves. Were you baptized in Gene's name? Was Gene crucified for you so that you should follow him? Paul asks rhetorical questions in rapid succession. Is Christ divided? Were you baptized in Paul's name? The answer is clearly no. But the rhetoric is warranted by their misbehavior and Paul's strong feeling about this division. Now, just as a note, Paul here is in no way downplaying baptism. He's just saying something like, I'm glad I didn't baptize many of you because you might say you were baptized in my name instead of Jesus' name. This is something we should reflect on as we see so many celebrity pastors rise to fame and fortune. Think about what Paul is saying here. He is upset because people are following their favorite teacher and it's causing division. They are arguing about things like who the better speaker is, things that don't matter. What do you think Paul would say about the church as a whole today? With this in mind, what do you think Paul would say about a church opening up right next to another church that's already there, like it's a business? That's division. Paul said he's glad he didn't baptize many of them so that they wouldn't attach themselves to him instead of Jesus. Now think about the modern celebrity preacher. What would he say about them attracting so much attention to themselves, so much wealth to themselves? Pastor worship is facilitated by the modern mega church. Now, disclaimers. There's nothing wrong with a healthy-sized church so that we can reach the community around us. It's not what I'm talking about. It's okay to pay a pastor a salary that's reflective of the average salary for that job in the area where he has his church, especially if he can't work another job because he's got to work at the church. That's totally okay. It's fine, too. We'll see when we get to chapter 9 that Paul talks about that. It's okay to pay people who are preaching the gospel, who are working in the church. Jesus says this as well. It's okay to give credit for their work. That's fine too. It's okay to use words of affirmation. Even give gifts, like pizza, <laughs> gift certificates to christianbook.com and socks. Just saying. That's totally fine. 
<laughs> There's nothing wrong <laughs> with any of these things. Christianbook.com. <laughs> Ding. <laughs> what is not okay is when a pastor lives in an extravagant way that is totally disproportionate to the community around him, especially with disregard for the poor. That person disqualifies himself. Titus 1.7, for an overseer as God's administrator must be blameless, not arrogant, not hot-tempered, not addicted to wine, not a bully, not greedy for money. What is not okay is when a person gets elevated to a lofty position and is no longer approachable. Unbelievable. But a friend of mine on Facebook, this was a couple of years ago, you know, I asked those questions. I never answer these questions, like, you know, copy and paste and answer this if you love me. And I'm like, I don't, don't want to do that. But the person answered the questions. And the questions were something like, if you could meet anybody, anybody at all in the world, who would it be? Nobody answered Jesus, you know. But number one, the President of the United States. I get it, depending on what year it is. <laughs> number two, the answer was my pastor. My pastor. If you cannot get a meeting with him, it's not your pastor. But think about it. Sounds unbelievable to all of you here because we're a small church. But think about the megachurch. You've got like 10,000 people in it. How does he meet with all those people? Can't do it. So there's a sub-pastor of a sub-pastor of a sub-pastor of a sub-pastor, and then they're sitting watching a guy they've never had a conversation with and never will. The megachurch creates a condition where it makes one person too important. The person who takes attention away from Jesus. And when, when this person makes a mistake or, worse yet, falls into sin, which is inevitable because the conditions for that to happen have been set up perfectly. So when this person falls into sin, it causes people to lose their faith because their faith was put into the wrong place. And think about what it does to a normal human being pastor who has to try to keep up appearances all the time. It's bad enough in a small church. So at very least, it turns that person into a liar. When a church gets too big and a pastor gets too famous, there's a point at which most feel that they can no longer afford to be completely honest in what happens to the preaching. Also, if you're a normal human being, how does having thousands of people coming to see you speak and applauding you all the time, no matter what you say, not go to your head. Even the person with the best self-control is dangerously flirting with their ego. For all my Spanish friends here, your ego is not your amigo. Learn that phrase. It's a good one. <laughs> People have asked me the question, we're filling up. We're going to fill up. What happens when we fill up all the seats? What do we do? I don't know, send people to a church that isn't full, maybe. We can try that. <clears throat> there are already too many churches here in Naples. I told you guys about the problems that that creates. When you have someone who's dealing with something, nine times out of ten, hey, we really need to talk. And you just don't see them anymore because they're at the church right next door. That's it. You cannot do effective discipline or accountability. Another question, but what if they like your teaching and what you know? That's why I'm at Bible study every Wednesday at 6 p.m. I'm trying to do my job in making disciples. So that maybe we can build people up and they can open up a church somewhere else where there isn't another church. Paul trained people up and left them in areas or sent them out to areas to start churches where there weren't other churches. That's the biblical example. And biblical preaching is all about taking the attention off of myself and putting it on to Jesus where it belongs. 
So our pastor is today preaching a worldly message, a self-centered, me-centric message, or are they preaching the cross and cru Christ crucified? We looked at this before, but repetition is a part of learning, and it's also about connecting the dots. Philippians 3.17 and following, Paul writes, Join in imitating me, brothers, and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. Remember, we did the series, Be Like Jesus. I have often told you, and now say again with tears, that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is in their shame, they are focused on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. One week I'm just going to read you Philippians and step off the stage. Beautiful. Are they focused on worldly things or heavenly things? things. That is the biblical line in the sand. The effect of the cross is that it flies in the face of the feel-good message. It baffles those who think they are wise by worldly standards, those who try to impress with fancy preaching, flashy clothes, promises of health and wealth. Paul calls them enemies of the cross of Christ. Remember what Paul said, he didn't evangelize with clever words. Why? Not with clever words, so that the cross of Christ will not be emptied of its effect. There are far too many people preaching a worldly message and broadcasting opinions that do not line up with the Word of God. Just saying what they know people want to hear and not preaching Christ crucified. The gospel without the cross is no gospel at all. Paul warns Timothy about these people, very famous passage of Scripture. 2 Timothy 4.1, I solemnly charge you before God in Christ Jesus, who is going to judge the living and the dead, and because of his appearing and his kingdom, proclaim the message, the gospel, persist in it, whether convenient or not. Rebuke, correct, and encourage with great patience and teaching, for the time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, they will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear something new. They will turn away from hearing the truth and turn aside to myths. In this first chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about Christ, the power and wisdom of God. He writes, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is God's power to us who are being saved. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and I'll set aside the understanding of the experts. Where's the philosopher? Where's the scholar? Where's the debater of this age? Hasn't God made the world's wisdom foolish? For since in God's wisdom the world did not know God, through wisdom, God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of the message preached. For the Jews ask for signs and the Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, yet to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's power and God's wisdom because God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. But we preach Christ crucified, unlike the false teachers. Paul's contrast here is amazing, right? God's foolishness, the cross, is wiser than human wisdom. The cross, the idea that God would come, think about this with me, in human form, make himself like a slave and willingly die on a cross is a crazy idea, even to us today, and it was back then. In 1857, graffiti was discovered in Rome on the wall of a boarding house. It depicted a human, a man, being crucified, the head of a donkey, Alexamenos worships his God. That's what the inscription says. Boys 
worshiping him. Someone was getting made fun of for worshiping Jesus. That's a stupid thing. What kind of God dies anyway? What kind of God becomes a human, weak, gets nailed to a cross? Lots of people were following suit. That's stupid, Alexa Menos. Why would you believe that? God's foolishness, the gospel message, and radical love. It's crazy to the world around us, but it's something that we are supposed to focus on, to meditate on constantly. It's exactly this love that he has for us that draws us to him. We are to be magnetized to the cross through the thought of what he did for us. Remember, I spoke about the gospel being the core of primary doctrine. This is what's important. If you have trouble remembering it, think of who Jesus is and what he did for us. Colossians 1, starting at verse 15. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation, for everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He's also the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself by making peace through the blood of his cross, whether things on earth or things in heaven. That is some beautiful truth right there. I have no words that can follow it, and give it any due justice except to point to the astonishing radical love of God, that he would flip the script and become like us, that he would offer up his own blood instead of the blood required of us so that we would be made righteous, reconciled to him and have eternal life. Unbelievable. This is God's love. This is God's foolishness to the world that he would come as a slave and humble himself to the point of obedience to death on a cross. It's madness to the perishing world, but grace, mercy, and love to us who have accepted him. What you must hear and know is that Jean did not die on a cross for you. Don't follow Gene. But Jesus did. I'm not a hero, but Jesus is. There's no celebrity pastor who can save you by their wisdom or wealth. I cannot save you. You have to put it all into Jesus. And anyone who takes the position of anything other than a mere slave of Christ in the shadow of the cross is just getting in the way, a noisy distraction from the beautiful melody of the gospel harmonized only by the scriptural truth that supports it. There's no celebrity name that is greater than his or even comes close. So I will leave you with this, not an opinion, but scriptural truth. Hebrews 1.1, long ago God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After making purification for sins on the cross, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, so he became higher in rank than the angels, just as the name he inherited is superior to theirs. And it is by this name, the name of Jesus Christ, that every knee 
should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. If you are listening to me today as I close, and you're still in doubt about this whole thing, who Jesus is and what he did, at very least, consider, just start with the historical evidence. That's it. That it is a better attested fact that Jesus performed miracles. He died on a cross and rose from the dead according to the historical record and standard than anything we have. Think about this for Alexander the Great. You would never doubt that Alexander the Great existed, would you? So if you would believe in Alexander, you should definitely believe in Jesus. And if you believe that Jesus existed, then you should consider what is written about him. That what he did proves he is who he says he is. Unambiguously, God this belief will determine whether you too rise from the dead. It is the most important decision you could ever make. If you have questions, I am not unreachable. I am here for you. Come speak to me, please. Come to Growth Track after service today. We'll feed you. You can come, I'll answer questions if you have them about the church. No problem. I don't care if it's just one person. You are all that important. Know that this morning. Every single one of you. If you want to write me, that's easier. Some people are shy, not me. <laughs> My email address is in the app. It's on the website. Write to me. That's fine. Right? You want to do it at your own pace. I am here for you. You have heard the truth of the gospel this morning. I hope it has touched your heart as it has mine.